Good evening, it's 5.12 p.m. and I'd like to call the October 6, 2021 regular board meeting of the Inglewood Unified School District to order. This meeting will be conducted in accordance with Assembly Bill 61, which amends the Ralph M. Brown Act to allow local governments to continue conducting virtual meetings. Uh, we're moving on to item number two. I'd like to acknowledge our amazing student, Mr. Raymond Alvarado, who will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Welcome, Mr. Alvarado. Mm, good afternoon. Will everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay. So, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Alvarado. So moving on to item number three, Ms. Montenegro, please call the roll. Uh, yes, uh, Board President, Dr. Carlos McGee. Present. Board Vice President, Ms. Margaret Turner Evans. Present. Board Member, Naomi Hammonds. Present. Board Member, Brandon Jean Myers. Present. Board Member, Ernesto Castillo. Present. Dr. Erica Torres. Present. Dr. Bernadette Lucas. Present. We have Ms. T Tiffany Egan uh, joining us. Present. Thank you. Mr. Rafael Guzman. Present. And Mr. Norberto Perez. Present. Uh, thank you. Please be informed that Spanish language interpretation is available during this meeting. Ofrecemos interpretación al español durante la junta. Gracias. Thank you so much, Ms. Montenegro. We're moving on to item number four. I hereby adopt the agenda with no modifications. We're going to move to item number five, student reports. I am so honored to introduce one of our amazing students from Inglewood Continuation High School, Mr. William Jordan, who is joining us this evening to share his student report. Welcome, Mr. Jordan. Greetings, Dr. Torres. Board members, district employees, and community partners. My name is William Jordan, and I'm here representing Inglewood Continuation High School. This year is off to a great start. Students report that they are very excited about being in person and able to connect with their peers in a small learning environment. Teachers are reporting that students are really focused and participating in classes even more before the closures. Progress reports were recently sent home and we are excited. Seniors said that after they received their progress reports, it became real that we are almost done. In September and again October, the students participated in the Attendance Matters campaign. The goal was to decrease the number of tardies in the morning and increase attendance on Mondays and Fridays. Students were provided with incentives such as weekly raffles, special snacks for those who were arriving on time. Moving forward, there are planned spirit days throughout October, such as wearing pink in support of breast cancer awareness on Fridays, Pinktober, college gear on Wednesdays for College Awareness Month, and sports day for Red Women Week to team up against drugs. El Camino College representatives hosted a college night in September and will host in November to showcase the programs and resources on campus. There will be a workshop at our school to fill out the South Bay Promise application for fall 2022. The workshop will discuss enrollment, cost of attending college, trade school, different programs, and the transferring process. The hope is for all students to apply for the South Bay Promise and complete their FAFSA application to prepare their future journey and pursuing higher education. Juniors will participate in the SoFi Stadium job 
shadow day. They will spend the day learning about various careers in sports and entertainment, meet a variety of department leaders and executives, and get behind the scenes look at all aspects for opening an NFL game or a live event. As we are enjoying our progress so far, we are looking forward to participating in the Water Youth Program. The program is sponsored by the Department of Beaches and Harbors and Fire Department of Los Angeles County, providing an opportunity for students to learn about ocean safety. Students will partic participate in activities such as kayaking, boogie boarding, and learn about life-saving skills such as CPR. This month, we begin our PBIS incentives in ROS. Our PBIS and Native demonstrates the standard behavior we, as students, are expected to uphold. RISE is an acronym for expectations. R for respect, I for integrity, S for service, and E for excellence. We are currently planning our first positive performance assembly of the school year where students will receive certificates and acknowledgement for their hard work and dedication in the classroom. Thank you for your time and have a great evening. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. You did an excellent job of providing us with your report. Uh, thank you to Dr. Kane uh, for recommending you to present um, on behalf of Inglewood Continuation High School. We're gonna move to item 5B. I'm so honored to also introduce one of our amazing students from Morningside High School, Mr. Raymond Alvarado. Welcome, Mr. Alvarado. Good evening, County Administrator, Dr. Tor Erica Torres, board members, faculty, and members of the community. I am Raymond Alvarado, ASB president at Morningside High School. We want to welcome our new principal, Gabriel Grego, and assistant principal, Dr. Mary Spruce. I bring you greetings from our principal, Mr. Grego, teachers, students, and staff. I am here to deliver this month's board report for the 2021-2022 school year. Learning is the priority continues to be our focus at Morningside High School, and we believe that it takes our entire community of students, teachers, and staff, and parents to be engaged. Our school has developed a common language around, one, learning outcomes, two, quality instruction that is rigorous, three, student engagement, and four, positive interactions among staff. This is a time for administration, students, teachers, and staff to engage in conversation and student learning styles and how to better those needs. We are completing Achieve 3000 level set testing, LPAC testing, and iReady testing. We are looking forward to our new college and career counselor that will be beginning on Monday, October 4th. Administration have started tardy sweeps to make sure that everyone is in class to get all of their instructional minutes. Williams visited our school last week and we did a great job where they gave us sufficient grade, which means every student has a book for all their classes. Counseling department. There will be a university representative Zoom meet presentation this month. Seniors had a Zoom meeting with a representative of Chico State University on Friday, September 17th via their government classes. Our EA, EAOP UCLA representative is available for students from September 2021 to June 2022 and is meeting with some seniors. On Friday, September 24th, seniors met with a CSUN representative via Zoom during English class. Counselors have officially started enrolling students in APEX this week. All students have a copy of their transcripts and they are aware of what courses need to be made up. Activities and sports. Morningside Monarchs won their first football game on Friday, September 24th against Los Angeles High School with a score of 28 to 22. Our back to school night was held on Thursday, September 16th. Attendance wasn't as expected. We celebrated our return with a welcome back rally that was held during our first day of school. Students are excited to as Students are as excited as we begin to plan homecoming festivities, which will start with a homecoming spirit week. Then our homecoming football game will be against Hawthorne High. And we are looking for an outside venue to host our homecoming dance. 
Our school ID pictures will be taken October 15th during English classes for both teachers and students. Seniors yearbook photos will be taken on Saturday, October 23rd and 30th by appointment only, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Our community day, our club day will be October 13th and 14th, where we will showcase our clubs to promote student engagement and extracurricular activities. College and career days, teachers and students wear their college gear on the second and fourth Monday of each month. Community liaison. We have our self-care, calmness, and wellness room on our website for our Inglewood community and school site in English and Spanish. We currently have a NAMI mental health six-week parent workshop series topics include anxiety, depression, mental health disorders, and mental health and stigma. We are, have continued to have COVID-19 testing for students every Thursday provided by GenStar Labs. We are still conducting temperature checks for teachers, students, and visitors entering Morningside campus. The Mucky Betts Foundation from the Los Angeles Dodgers and collaboration with Catholic Big Brothers and Big Sisters sponsored 27 tickets for MHS students to attend the Dodgers game last Thursday against the San Diego Padres. Thank you for this opportunity to share our side pride, and you will be hearing from Morningside again very soon, where learning is the priority. So, Mr. Alvarado, um, thank you so much for sharing your student report with us. Thank you to your principal, Mr. Griego, for recommending you to share this with us. Um, Mr. Alvarado, Mr. Jordan, both of you did an excellent job representing your schools. Congratulations again. Uh, board members, do you have any questions or comments for our students? Both did an excellent job and I'm always wanting to encourage students to come and share and just make sure that their voices are heard and um, you both did a great job. Thank you so much for sharing. Any other board members, questions, comments? Okay, thank you again and congratulations, Mr. Alvarado and Mr. Jordan. Uh, board members, we will now move to item number six of our board agenda. Uh, we have a series of recognitions this evening. And at the end of our recognitions, we're gonna um, open it up for any comments or questions that our board members might have. And so this evening, we are really excited to honor students, staff, and parents from Kelso Elementary and Crozier Middle School. I'm going to ask Dr. Lucas, our Chief Academic Officer, to please get us started. Dr. Lucas, welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Torres. You know, and um, the board members know what an honor it is for me to introduce this very, very important segment of our board agenda. Nelson Mandela said that history will judge us by the difference we make in the everyday lives of children. And our principals are about to introduce adults who do just that every day. And history is gonna judge them very, very beautifully and well because of the con contributions they're making for our students. I would now like to hand this off to Ms. Irene. Green Green, principal of Kelso Elementary School. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, parents, board members, Dr. Torres and cabinet. Um, as Dr. Lucas said, my name is Irene Green and I am the proud principal of Kelso Elementary School. And tonight I would like to present our certificates to, should I go on or wait? <laughs> Uh, hold on just a few minutes. We're trying to pull it up. Okay. Okay. Our first certificate goes to um, one of our custodians, Harriet Simmons. Harriet has been with IUSD for 19 years. Um, she is the true definition of teamwork. She always steps up to ensure that Kelso's campus looks its best. Whether it's her job or another person's job, she steps in and makes 
sure the job gets done at all costs. Her work ethic really stands out. So congratulations tonight to Harriet Simmons. Next, we have our RSP teacher, Mr. Michael Duckworth. Mr. Duckworth has been with Inglewood for five years, but he joined the Kelso family two years ago. Um, he came in and hit the ground running. And with, within a matter of a month and a half, he had all, all of our IEPs back into compliance. Um, he is um, diligent at school and he um, is a team player as well. He steps in whenever and however he is needed. So I'm happy to have him as a Kelso Cheetah. Thank you, Mr. Duckworth, for all that you do. Now I will recognize one of our parents. Um, our first parent is Cynthia Vega. Um, as we know, everyone's time is valuable and Ms. Vega's willingness to contribute some of her valuable time to the students here at Kelso Elementary School is a commitment to the well-being um, of not only her child, but all of our students. Her contribution continues to make um, she continues to make contributions by donating school supplies, books, and all-around support, which has made a difference to students' educational experience over the last few years. Here at Kelso, we enjoy a kind, caring community that cultivates the highest standards of academic, social, and emotional growth. The efforts of volunteers like Ms. Vega are a vital part of the community. Ms. Vega, thank you for all that you do. At Ellie Cross. Um, it is an esteemed pleasure to have Mrs. Cross as a parent of Kelso. One of our teachers has had her for three years, um, over the past, over the past as three years, excuse me. Um, she is readily available, supportive, and is aware of the social, emotional, and educational needs of all her children. She has demonstrated with consistency that her beliefs are well aligned with Kelso's core values as she speaks, as she seeks opportunities to suggest resources and rent, render her unwavering report of uh, support. Just recently, she agreed to um, help with the sign up of GenStar Labs to have our students tested weekly. So thank you, Ms. Arelli Cross, for your um, dedication to our students and our school. Ooh. Alrighty. Our first student is Ms. Aaliyah Jackson. She has been at Kelso since um, kindergarten. Uh, she's been an inspiration and example for students in the classroom. Aside from the fact that she has been incredibly diligent with all of her work, she is especially responsible and she is a role model for her peers. She has helped her classmates with their work and strives to be a positive influence in the classroom. She has shown a high level of responsibility every year that she's been at Kelso. Um, it has been a pleasure to nominate Aaliyah for this award on behalf of her, her teachers who still smile when Aaliyah's name is mentioned. So congratulations, Ms. Aaliyah Jackson. And last but not least, we have Jalen Russell. Jalen has been at, Kel at Kelso since he was a kindergartner as well. His kindergarten teacher said of him then, Jalen is such an enthusiastic learner, a smart and intelligent student that is always willing to help others. As a sixth grader, his teacher now admits that these characteristic, characteristics still stand today. In addition to that, he exhibits excellent work habits as he participates during instruction, completes tasks, and produces quality work. Most of all, he is kind. His teacher is pleased to recognize him with, for his diligence and looks forward to his future successes. So congratulations to our students, staff, and um, parents of Kelso Elementary School. It's great to be a Kelso Cheetah. Thank you. Okay, and I have the privilege of speaking to Ms. Green's leadership. And I know every single cabinet member wants to do this for every single principal, Ms. Green. Um, I have watched you just evolve and grow. And one of the things I admire about you so much is your commitment to your own professional growth in the context of your school community. You were always advocating for them, always. And your deep passion for them comes out in every conversation Ms. Hosea has with you, every conversation you have with me and members of cabinet. I will never forget it for the community as one example. Ms. Green needed um, support at her school site for her students. And she did not hesitate for one second calling on every cabinet member to come out and Ed Services member to come out and give that support that her students deserved. When she talks about instruction, she ties it to data and how the school is moving in terms of concrete examples connected to strategies. 
She is always advocating for her students, her parents, her community, her teachers, her staff. And for that, I want to commend you, Ms. Green. And I look forward to growing and learning with you in the months and hopefully years ahead. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Green. So now I'm very honored to, as we get ready to transition to our next school, to introduce Ms. Sylvia Branch, principal of Crozier Middle School, who will honor and acknowledge her community this evening. Ms. Branch, I know we're waiting for your certificates to come up, but just to set the stage for you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Dr. Torres, distinguished board, cabinet, and community. I'm Mrs. Branch, the proud principal of Crozier Middle School, home of the Bulldogs. Um, my first award of recognition uh, goes to Latrice Leverett, who's an outstanding seventh grade <clears throat> pre-algebra teacher. She's also our math department chair and also our AVID chair. Whenever you go in her classroom, you will see evidence of teaching and learning. And we appreciate how you go above and beyond uh, to provide high quality instruction for all students. Your sacrifices don't go unnoticed. You truly care about the students. Uh, most recently, Mrs. Lavarette is pursuing an administrative credential. She is also a student advocate for all of our students and provides uh, MTSS for all students whenever you enter her class. Uh, Mrs. Lavarette, I would just like to say congratulations and thank you so much for all of your hard work and being a team player, a Crozier, a Crozier champion. Um, our next recognition is for Isidra Tedesi. She is an amazing cafeteria manager. Our cafeteria manager, she works hard to provide quality service to all of our students. You are making a huge impact on our campus and you are such an asset to our school. Thank you. Next, Mrs. Tina Dennis. She is an amazing parent who, um, is actually a member of both of my councils. She's a member of my ELAC council. Yes, Mrs. Dennis is. Um, uh, that's our English Language Advisory Committee, but she also sits on our school site council committee as well. And I would just like to thank you for your con continued support, your donations, the donuts that I don't need. <laughs> And then also, I would like to thank you for your dedication and just being a team player and being there for our students and being present, highly visible, and always donating your time. That is so important, your time and seeing your smiling face every day. You're there. You come to the office to see if there's anything that you can do to assist. And I just really, really, really appreciate everything that you do for all of our students. Thank you so much, Mrs. Dennis. And next we have Louis Ramirez. Mr. Ramirez, I am really grateful to you as a parent. And also I feel so honored that you are part of Crozier's learning community. Mr. Ramirez is also a member of our ELAC uh, committee. And he also volunteers to assist our school wide. If there's anything that we need him to do, he's always there for our scholars. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Ramirez. Wow, um, Arlesia, Arlesia Caldwell. What can I say? I just can't say enough about this scholar. She is a stellar student. You deserve this award of recognition this evening. The scholar is also always practicing responsibility. Um, we have a Crozier pause. We call it P-A-W-S, practice responsibility, achieve success, work and play safely and strive for excellence. And she actually exhibits these qualities every single day. She has perfect attendance 
And also, I was so, so proud to hear that you are one of my top scholars. You received an A plus in every single one of your classes. That's amazing. Um, next, our next scholar is Jasmine, Jasmine Kayo. Jasmine, warmest congratulations to you. You're always practicing our pause as well and striving for excellence. Thank you so, so, so much for staying focused. And also, I was so proud to hear that you are also one of our top scholars with a high GPA, uh, A plus in every single classroom, no referrals to the office, no discipline. You're always on point. All of your teachers have so many wonderful things to say about you. And when I come in the classroom for observations, I always see a student who's engaged in learning. And I just would like to recognize you this evening and say that I am so proud of you and continue to work hard and you will succeed and strive for excellence. Thank you so much, scholars. Thank you. And now it's time to honor Ms. Branch. So um, many people who know me know that I, anyone who will listen, I tell about how deeply honored I am to work with our group of principals. Ms. Branch is like Ms. Green, yet another reason why. Um, one of the things I admire so much again about Ms. Branch is her commitment to her school site. That's a common thread that runs through um, all of our principals. Let me give you some examples of what that means in the, uh, in, in the example of Ms. Branch. She is a tremendous advocate for the education of middle, uh, middle grade age students. She is always bringing ideas and thoughts and divergent thinking to how we can serve them. She is so committed to her school community. She brings a positive sense of energy everywhere she goes. When I call her during the school day, she often has to call me back because she's out on campus checking on her students, checking on her staff, checking on her facilities. She is an extraordinary, extraordinary member of the team in her positivity, her commitment to the profession, and her commitment to educating middle school students. Ms. Branch, I'm so honored to work with you, and thank you for your ongoing, unwavering commitment to Inglewood Unified School District and Crozier Middle School in particular. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Lucas and Ms. Green and Ms. Branch. I just want you to know uh, that I appreciate the two of you, your leadership, your commitment to our district. Congratulations to you on all of your achievements. Um, and thank you for joining us this evening to recognize our amazing students, staff, and parents of Kelso and Crozier. We appreciate you and congratulations to all. Um, next, we're going to transition to item 6B. And this is a recognition of one of our departments in the Inglewood Unified School District. It's our police department. And joining us this evening is Chief uh, Martin Cisak, and he's gonna get us started with our recognition. Chief Cisak, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Torres, and good evening. Um, Dr. Torres, uh, uh, board members, cabinet, uh, our students, and any families that are joining us tonight. I am very, very, very proud to be here to honor our school police department. Uh, it is my pleasure to recognize all of our safety assistants and uh, Officer Galden, and let's get started. Uh, today, we, the Inglewood School Police Department, humbly recognizes our district's safety assistants for the phenomenal job of protecting our students and staff since the start of the 2021-2022 school year. The team has shown great dedication and commitment for the safety of our school district. Each one of you, and all of your names are listed here, is vital to ensuring the mission and vision of our safety team. You are commended and appreciated for your greatness. We applaud and commend your commitment to excellence. Special recognition to Mr. Keith Johnson, one of our safety assistants, for an outstanding job at Inglewood High School recently. Keith has demonstrated his intrinsic value for the Inglewood Unified School District and the school police department. We applaud and commend his commitment to excellence. 
and special recognition to Officer Heron Galden in recognition of your outstanding, and I'm looking at him because he's sitting right next to me over here, of your outstanding dedication to the Inglewood Unified School District School Police Department. Lieutenant Galden, um, I'm um, sorry, Officer Galden has for two years been more than just an officer. You are appreciated for your expertise and professionalism in safeguarding not just your safety team of security, but the entire Inglewood Unified School District. You have demonstrated the true vision statement values of the school police department. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you. Thank you, Chief CSAC. And I just wanted to take this opportunity as well to thank our entire team um, that really works diligently each and every day to ensure safety throughout all of our schools, all of our offices, our entire community. A uh, special thank you to Chief CSAC uh, for your commitment to the success of our district. We appreciate your leadership as well. Uh, special recognition to Mr. Johnson, congratulations. Thank you so much for all that you do. And of course, Officer Galden, we appreciate your commitment, your leadership and vision as well. Congratulations to all. Thank you so much, Chief, for that wonderful recognition of the Inglewood Unified School District Police Department. Uh, board members, we're going to open it up for questions or comments about any of the recognitions uh, so far. We'll start with Dr. McGee. Ms. Evans. I think Dr. McGee left. Uh, my screen is black. I didn't see any of the, the officers that uh, Mr. CSAC showed. So I don't know what's going on at my house, but I didn't see anything. My screen is still black right now. It says that uh, he's screen sharing, but there's nothing there. But anyway, I wanted to talk about um, Ms. Green and uh, Ms. Branch. Your employees, your parents, your students are doing excellent work. Erlicia and Jasmine, who are your high achievers, that makes me very proud to hear students getting straight A's. Let some of that rub off on the rest of your peers, please. It's wonderful that you can do that in these trying times. And to all of, all of you who are doing such a good job, I appreciate it, I thank you. Congratulations to all of you, those were wonderful. Um, uh, reports of what's going on at your schools and, and to honor the people who are at your schools. Thank you, Ms. Evans. We appreciate that. Uh, any other board members' questions or comments? Okay, thank you again and congratulations to all. We're going to move to item number 60. Uh, we're going to proceed with employee recognition, and I'm excited to introduce our labor partners. We're going to begin with Ms. Abba Ingisa the president of the Inglewood Teachers Association. Thank you, Ms. Ngisa, for joining us this evening. Thank you, Dr. Torres. Good evening, Dr. Torres, cabinet and advisory board members, members of the community. Tonight, we, our executive board, would like to recognize our very own Jennifer Heath, who is one of our intervention teachers, who's been teaching in the independent study program. Jennifer says that her commitment to the independent study program began when she realized how much work was going to be involved and how short staffed we truly were. She worked with two other teachers, Wendy and Rosemary, and who are also assigned to independent study. And she says that they quickly formed a bond, had countless impromptu Zoom meetings, and exchanged thousands of texts supporting one another and sharing any information learned. Knowing that the responsibility that came with trying to get a completely new program started was taking away from all of her other responsibilities, Jennifer says that she really wants to thank Ms. Eugema James, Ms. Fortunato, and Dr. Lucas, because they had to focus on inspiring her to embrace each and every challenge that she encountered. She says that they gave them so much support. And the best part, she says, of independent study has been the family she's met. She says that independent study, although it is quite structured differently than distance learning, the good thing is she still gets to see her children and some of the parents every day, and they have been troopers. There have been many challenges, Jennifer says, and the students have persevered, and she's really proud of them. About independent study, Jennifer says, I think I may have learned just as much as the children have during the first 
few weeks of school. We want to thank Jennifer for just going in there. We've heard so much about the work Jennifer and her team is doing, and we were just so proud to have her as one of our members. So thank you, Jennifer, for your work and being ITA strong. Thank you so much, Ms. Ngisa, for joining us this evening. And congratulations to Ms. Jennifer Keith. We celebrate you this evening and we congratulate you on all of your achievements. Thank you so much for all that you do. Um, board members and community, we're gonna move to our next presentation under 6C2, Employee Recognition of Classified Employees. I am so honored to introduce Ms. Lillian Grant, President, to get us started. Ms. Grant, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, Dr. Torres, uh, school board members and cabinet. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to acknowledge uh, our classified employees this evening and their many contributions to our district. And first, I'd like to start off with Aida Zuniga. First, let me say that we are so proud to share this employee with the community this evening. Ida Zuniga's love for teaching and learning dates all the way back to her days of being an educator in Mexico. Ms. Zuniga came to IUSD after missing the classroom environment and her love for impacting the lives of students. She has been working at Worthington Elementary for 23 years as a special needs instructional assistant where she helps our children access all areas of the curriculum. Ms. Zuniga's educational calling is, is an important one because she helps children in the learning process and motivates them in different ways, in addition to being an effective support to her classroom teacher. Ada shares a great rapport with everyone at her site and throughout her years of service has built some amazing relationships. One of her most memorable moments was teaching students folkloric dance in the after school program and watching them perform in front of their family and friends. But Ms. Zuniga's talent doesn't stop there. She is also a talented artist, which when needed, makes her bulletin board game super strong. So here's to one of our most sought after SDC instructional assistants in IUSD. Ada Zuniga, we thank you for the time, attention that you have given to our students each day combined with loyalty and unwavering dedication. Always remember that your support to our students will have a lifelong impact academically, social, emotionally, and personally. Congratulations and continue to shine bright. Next, we have Ken Moria Woodson. Ken Moria Woodson has worked at Woodworth Monroe since 2014 providing those extra pair of hands that every school needs to be successful. She started with Inglewood Unified School District in 1991 and have provided service, has provided service to our community throughout several assignments, including secretary, clerk typist, and severely handicapped technician. But it was her transition to community liaison specialist that put her campus on the map. Before the pandemic hit, and after constant requests from the female students at Woodward Monroe, Ms. Woodson found a way to start a dance team on campus. And with the help of two amazing college students make their dream a reality. And with a little hard work and some amazing soundtracks, <laughs> the dance team won first and second place in their very first competition. But her most most memorable moment was when our mayor, city council, and the Los Angeles Rams showed up with Nike cleats and uniforms just a month after her request. You see, Ms. Woodson ap approaches every project with a can-do spirit that results in positive outcomes over and over again. And if you ever have the opportunity to just sit and chat with her for a while, she will humbly confess that it brings her joy to help parents who seek resources to better themselves often returning to school for their GED or enrolling in a course to learn a trade. But if you ask any of the parents that she's helped, they'll just look at you and say, well, we give the credit to Ms. Woodson and state how they're now better able to help their children with their homework. 
Ken Moria believes that in everything there is room for improvement. So each day she focuses on making a difference and showing her students and families that Woodworth Monroe really does care. She adds that she loves her coworkers and that they make a great team. Well, Ken Moria Woodson, we think you are great. And so tonight we say thank you for your outstanding contributions to our students and families and inspiring the Woodworth Monroe team to success. Continue to shine bright. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Grant. We appreciate you joining us this evening to acknowledge two of our amazing classified employees. Congratulations to Ms. Zuniga, Ms. Woodson on all of your, your achievements. We appreciate your commitment to our district and congratulations again. Uh, board members and community, we're moving to item 63. Uh, this is employee recognitions of the Inglewood Management Association, and I'm really honored to introduce to all of you Mr. Miguel Perez. He's going to get us started with our recognitions. Well, Welcome, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Torres. Thank you, Cabinet, and of course, our esteemed Board of Education. I'd like to begin by recognizing Dr. Kiwana Kane. Dr. Kane. Dr. Kane has served uh, Inglewood Unified for over 21 years. In total, she's worked 30 years with children. She's been a teacher at Wood uh, Warren Lane uh, Highland uh, uh, Elementary. She was the assistant principal at Payne Elementary, served as principal at City Honors, and currently serves as our principal at Inglewood Continuation, and she is a CTE administrator. She's also served as ASA's direct uh, district coordinator, She's been a PIF at Daniel Friedman. She served as summer school administrator for high school and elementary. She was a Marzano coach. And at one point, she also served as secretary for ITA. Her hobbies include old school music, classic lowrider cars, dancing, which I've seen personally, painting, reading, and of course, family time. She is proud to be an amazing member of the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, Inc. And uh, her husband is also a teacher at La Tijera K Elementary. Her children also attend schools in Inglewood Unified. All four of them either have come to our school or continue. And I am very proud. She is also uh, the second half of the hot salsa team. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Kane. Let's give her a big round of applause, please. Our second recognition uh, goes to Ms. Margaret Nayfield. Ms. Nayfield has served in education for 20 years and 19 of those here at Inglewood Unified. She served as an elementary school teacher at BenaQ and Daniel Friedman. She served as program coordinator at BenaQ and Inglewood High School. She served as an instructional coach at Monroe, Monroe Middle School, and then served as an assistant principal at, Monroe, at Woodworth Monroe. Currently as a principal at Frank D. Parent, where she helps manage that school and does it beautifully. What she is very proud of, she is a third generation of Inglewood Unified School District educators. Her grandmother was an IUSD teacher for 36 years at Woodworth. Her mother was an IUSD teacher for 38 years at Bennett Um, And she and uh, Ms. Uh, Nayfield also attended Bennett herself. Her hobbies include spending time with her family, her two boys and her husband, and going out and just having fun. So with that, I'd like to congratulate Ms. Nayfield for an amazing work and a third generation educator here at IUSD. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and recognizing two of our amazing educational leaders here in the Inglewood Unified School District. Congratulations, Dr. Kane. Congratulations, Ms. Mayfield. We appreciate you so much and we salute you this evening. Thank you again. Uh, board members and community, um, we're going to transition to reports and presentations. But before I do that, I wanted to ask our board, if you, do you have any comments, any questions? of any of our presenters uh, this evening. Hey, thank you. Congratulations. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no worries. Congratulations to everyone. 
keep up the great work. I, I tell you, it, 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 it's so befitting and so humbling to serve uh, with you all. It, it, it's great. So just keep up the great work. Thank you so much. Mr. Myers, we appreciate you and your kind words. Any other board members? Dr. Torres, can you hear me? Because my screen is cutting off and my the, the sound is not coming through clearly. So can you hear me at all? Yes, I can hear you. Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Ms. Evans. Okay, so we are going to reach out to you, Ms. Evans, just to make sure we address any of the tech uh, problems that you're experiencing. So Marisela will be in touch with you. Uh, board members and community, okay. we're going to uh, transition now to reports and presentations. We're gonna begin with item 7A. Our board member, Mr. Brandon Myers, will provide us with an update regarding the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. Welcome, Mr. Myers. Thank you, Dr. Torres, and good evening to our community. Uh, I'd like to just say, um, again, thank you so much to all our participants um, that, that come to our meetings virtually, that view, that send their comments in. It actually shows us that you're, you're interested. Um, the more the merrier. Uh, it, it helps us navigate um, how we need to function uh, as a committee. Um, so. Um, I'm going to give an update about the uh, Citizens Oversight uh, Committee meeting, which was last held uh, August 31st. And this meeting was a bit different. Um, uh, the cabinet uh, took us on a virtual tour, which I thought was amazing. So um, we've seen a lot of improvements that, that, that were done at uh, Morningside High, uh, Woodworth, Monroe, and um, as well as Oak Street. I tell you, Oak Street looks amazing. Um, we also gathered um, bond updates um, as far as the expenditures, um, current financials, and as well as the annual report uh, for the CBOC. So um, I encourage all of our community members that are interested um, in the improvement um, of our schools, please attend our next meeting. Uh, I'm sure it'll be virtual, but it'll be November 10th uh, at five o'clock p.m., all right? So mark your calendars for that. And I'll rest right there. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you so much, Mr. Myers. We're going to open it up to see if any other board members have questions or comments regarding your update. Uh, board members, questions or comments for Mr. Myers? Okay. Thank you again, Mr. Myers. We appreciate the update. We're going to transition to item 7B. Uh, board member, Mr. Ernesto Castillo, will provide us with an update on the work to support our interagency collaboration. So welcome, Mr. Castillo. Thank you, Dr. Torres. Um, and thank you to the board and for the cabinet for allowing me to, to provide update, updates about the interagency uh, continuation work that we're doing with the city council. Um, one of the things that I did want to bring up after speaking to the city council staff is the upcoming uh, ribbon cutting event at the Yola Center. I know we've all been very excited to see the construction begin about a couple of years back, but it's finally here. Uh, it's gonna be an opportunity for our students to get after school music programming for free, free instruments, free lessons. It's you know, something that I think every kid could definitely benefit from. So any family listening out there, make sure you file your, um, fill out the interest form and make sure you're filling it out and following up with the uh, Yola Center to assure that Inglewood residents also get a a seat at the um, music programming for the students. So just wanted to provide that update. I think the ribbon cutting event is next Saturday. Um, and another update I wanted to give was about our libraries here in our city. Um, the Inglewood City Libraries are moving to a fine-free library. So for all those fines that have prevented people from coming back to the library, uh, consider that a done deal. You don't have to worry about that. Please come back to our libraries. Please use our libraries. We're going to forgive most of the fines. I'm not sure when that is being approved. I have to check in again with our assistant city manager, but that should be coming soon. So it's an opportunity for us to not uh, criminalize or impunitize um, any reasons why not to be able to pay these fees. Uh, it's a free library. It's free for the community. It shouldn't be independent to coming to the uh, our beautiful buildings and seeing our amazing staff and reading. 
just want to provide a few updates for you. And um, if you have any any questions, hope I can answer that. Thank you so much, Mr. Garcia. We appreciate your updates. We're going to open it up to board members um, to see if they have any questions or comments. Board members. Okay, thank you again, Mr. Castillo, for your update. We appreciate it. Um, so next board and community um, is item 7C. Uh, this is the announcement of appointment of members of the School Closure and Consolidation Committee. Assembly Bill AB 1840, uh, Codified and Education Code, Section 42161, provides a list of benchmarks, which are examples of activities to improve the district's fiscal solvency, long-term fiscal stability and recovery. And one of those benchmarks includes the adoption of a school district facility closure and consolidation plan. And so in alignment with AB 1840 and education code section 42161 and pursuant to the California Department of Education's closing um, a school best practices guide on June 30th, 2021, the county administrator approved Resolution number 49 2020 2021. Okay, strike on one. By school districts. And approving bylaws for the committee. Pursuant to the resolution and committee bylaws, the committee shall consist of at least seven members. On September 15th, 2021, I appointed the following six members of the committee with the exception of a member to represent the business organization representing the business community located in the district, which we worked diligently to fill. And so Tiara Johnson, parent or guardian of child enrolled in the district, Tambra Thompson, teacher in the district, Vanessa Davenport, classified employee in the district, uh, Miguel Perez, administrator in the district, Sylvia Latson Salvi, landowner in the district, and Wesley Newman, community at large. And today, board and community, with the approval of item 12F2, further on in this agenda, I'm pleased to announce that Mr. Dexter Hall will be appointed to fill the business organization representing the business community category. And with this appointment, all representative categories of the school closure and consolidation committee have been filled. Board and community, moving on to item 7D, uh, Mr. Rafael Guzman will provide us with an update regarding our district's cash flow. Mr. Guzman, welcome. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Torres, and uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening to uh, our uh, cabinet, our wonderful board members, our amazing community. Uh, it's a pleasure to present uh, today regarding our cash flow. Um, next slide, please. So today we'll be reviewing a cash flow recap, um, cash flow projections, as well as any cash borrowing options. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. And so again, you know, we, we keep on reviewing these key terms. Uh, we have people that come into our board meetings and we wanna make sure that the community is aware of what these terms mean. And so we'll often review these terms and make sure we're all on the same page about what they are because they're very important to understanding uh, the financials of the district. Uh, so today we'll be talking about cash flow. And so cash flow, when we talk about that, really we're talking about a report that demonstrates the cash position of the district. This is different from the budget position as several factors may delay the receipt of cash. So um, it's kind of like our own personal budgets, right? Uh, we might get paid enough in the month to cover our expenses, but we have to make sure we get paid on a certain date before our expenses are due, right? Um, so it's kind of the same methodology, only at a much larger scale, of course, uh, at a school district-wide scale. Uh, deferrals, um, we, you'll hear that mentioned every now and then. And that's essentially when a uh, the district is paid its main revenue source uh, on a consistent appropriation schedule. So if the, say, if the state decides to postpone the payments to a date outside of the schedule, that's what we consider a deferral. So when you hear deferrals, what you're hearing really is uh, that our revenue source um, is being uh, postponed to a future date. And uh, the last term that I wanted to review is TRAN or TRANS, which is uh, acronym for Tax and Revenue Anticipation Notes. Uh, these are advances of cash based upon verified revenues that were deferred. So it's not like you can borrow against something that you, uh, like a new borrowing on something that doesn't exist. This is 
uh, based upon verified revenues that you would have gotten, but they were deferred at the state level. So once the deferrals are received from the state, generally they are intercepted by the issuer of the TRAN. And of course, we just want to emphasize that you cannot borrow more than what was deferred and the advance must be paid immediately upon receipt of the deferred funds. So as soon as we get the deferral from the state, then we have to pay back the issuance of the uh, tax and revenue and anticipation notes. Uh, next slide, please. So why is cash flow so important and why do we present it every month? Well, cash flow is what, going, is what ultimately is going to make you or break you. If you run out of cash, you're, you're, you're in very big, big, big trouble. <laughs> and so we want to make sure that we constantly review our cash flow and that we ensure that our projections are timely and accurate. We have to know if, how much, and when this cash borrowing needs to take place. So in you know the example I gave before, if, for example, uh, in our own personal uh, life, right? If you are paid on the 15th of the month, but your bills are due on the 1st, you have to find a way to you know bridge that gap, right? Between the 1st and the 15th. So uh, with the school district, we get a lot of different sources of revenue, um, but we wanna make sure that we have enough cash on hand at any given moment to cover payroll, to cover accounts payable, to cover any sort of item that the district needs to uh, uh, pay during that month. And so knowing all the internal and external borrowing options available, along with any restrictions and or timelines associated with each one is very important as well. Uh, so we have to understand if there are options for internal borrowing or external borrowing, we should evaluate those as well if they are necessary. Uh, but basically the cash flow report will help us visualize whether or not we're going to need to look at uh, borrowing uh, so that we don't run out of cash in, in any sort of situation. Next slide, please. So uh, cash flow projections. So if we can go to the next slide, this is what the uh, cash, uh, well, first let's talk a little bit about deferrals. So in 2020, 2021, which is uh, the fiscal year, which starts in uh, July of 2020, ends in June of 2021, we had deferrals during that year. And so we did issue a TRAN um, and we, uh, but this year, uh, fiscal year 21, 22, which is from July 1st, 2021 through June 30th of 2022, we do not anticipate deferrals. So that's great news from the state. Um, so we do not anticipate any deferrals. Um, and uh, just for your information, the state has intercepted the deferred payments as the district participated in the CSFA trans pool. Um, so we did receive those deferrals in 2021. The state's already intercepted those uh, those deferrals uh, payments that they uh, paid back to the to the district. Um, next slide, please. So this is what the cash flow uh, report sort of looks like. And as you can see here, there's a lot of numbers. Um, and so it's kind of hard to look at it here. So I, I developed another kind of uh, tool that you can visualize it under, but basically the bottom line, the last line, all the way at the bottom shows you where your ending balance is regarding cash. So we're looking very healthy at the end of uh, the month of August, uh, we were at 43.5 million. We're anticipating to be at about uh, 50.1 million uh, at the end of September. Uh, you know, that month has not closed yet as far as accounting. I know the month ended on September 30th, but we still do some accounting transactions that might affect that number, but essentially that's where we're at. If we go to the next slide, it's a little bit easier to look at it there. Um, it's a little easier to visualize it. As you'll note, September still shows projections. I don't normally uh, convert it to an actual until that month is uh, closed accounting wise. That normally happens like around the, between the 13th and the 15th of the following month. And since today is October 6th, you wouldn't see September closed yet. But what you do see here is that the district has uh, plenty of cash uh, as of now and um, it's at sitting at about 50.1 million at the end of September. And we don't project to be in a, any sort of situation of cash borrowing that uh, may come up. Uh, next slide, please. So cash borrowing options, uh, if we go to the next slide. And uh, one second, well, uh, this, okay, here we go. So in fiscal year 2020, 2021, the district participated in the state's uh, California School Finance Authority trans pool. Um, and we did receive those disbursements and the state did intercept those payments. Um, so uh, the agency was, the payments were intercepted. So uh, that was for those deferrals in 2020, 2021. Now in 21, 22, we did not need to enter into any TRAN. We don't anticipate to enter into any TRAN because we have sufficient cash, but we still will continue to closely monitor cash flow. And currently we have other sources that we can borrow against if needed, but as we're looking at right now, and as you saw in the earlier slides, our cash flow looks very healthy. 
the district has a healthy cash position and does not anticipate a need to borrow cash in fiscal year 21-22. Next slide, please. And I believe that is all. So thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Turn it back to you, Dr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Guzman. As always, we appreciate all of your wonderful updates that you provide to us. Thank you so much. We're going to open it up to our board members to see if they have any questions or comments. Board members. Just like to say thank you for your uh, for your great informative presentation. It's it's always important to understand where the money is and where it's going. Thank you so much, Mr. Guzman. Amazing job. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Any other board members? Okay. Thank you again, Mr. Guzman. Great work as always. Thank you. You're very welcome. Next, um, board and community, we're going to transition to item 7E. And this is an update on our district's assessment data. I'm going to introduce our chief academic officer, Dr. Lucas, and she'll introduce the team presenting as Thank well. You. Dr. Lucas, welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Torres. Thank you so much, board members and fellow cabinet members. I'm excited to present with my colleagues. Um, I could do nothing without them. They are an incredible team. So tonight I, I present with Ms. Eugema Hosea, Mr. Leonardo Lopez, and Ms. Stephanie Fortunato. I'm ready, Mr. Arvin, thank you. So um, to Dr. Torres's point, we will be giving an update on student assessment effective the 2021 school year. So we're looking back so that we can go forward. Um, then we will get into what the cycle of inquiry and assessment looks like for this school year. And then lastly, we'll look forward to the 2020, 2022 school year in terms of next steps. I'm ready, Mr. Arvin, thank you. So as a gentle reminder, I know our board members and community members uh, might remember um, several presentations we did on data last year. Um, again, we want to remind everyone that our entire um, kind of data ecosystem, the way we approach assessment and data in the district, is tethered to um, our FICMAT standards, the IUSD strategic plan that so many community members work so hard on, our local control and accountability plan, and our instructional plan out of Ed Services. Additionally, we have a, an assessment calendar that, calendar that was a collaborative effort between educational services, ITA, and IMA. And that's a very important piece that we worked as a community of educators to put together an assessment calendar that honored our students' learning and our teachers' teaching. And then also that we provide protected time through the cycle of inquiry for our teachers and site administrators and district staff to study student data and make corrections to the instructional program and adjustments in order to meet the needs of our students. And indeed, lastly, we continue formative and summative assessment for this school year because both are incredibly important. I'm now gonna turn it over to Ms. Fortunato. Great, thank you, Dr. Lucas. And good evening, Dr. Torres and cabinet and board members. This evening, we wanna provide an overview of some of the assessment tools that we use to gauge student learning throughout the school year. So you'll see here identified on the slide, there are three different assessment tools there. And we use these three times a year for our students to partake in a diagnostic in both language arts and mathematics. So first there on the screen is the Dibbles assessment. And the Dibbles program, which is otherwise known as the dynamic indicator of basic early literacy skills, is administered to our students in kindergarten through second grade. And the program indicates the essential skills our students need to master in order to become a proficient reader. And so students are asked to answer questions that gauge things like their phonological awareness, their fluency, their comprehension, and their vocabulary. And next on the screen you'll see is the iReady program, which is used in reading for our students in grades three through six, and then in math for our students in first through 12th grade. And the iReady diagnostic is an adaptive assessment and it's really designed to provide actionable insight into our students' needs. And so the data that comes from these diagnostics identifies students' strengths, their knowledge gaps at different sub-skill levels, and it also the data is used to help our teachers in creating instructional groups so that they can work with students on a very specific focus skill. 
And then finally, you'll see the Achieve 3000 program. And this one is used for our secondary students. So for both middle and high school um, in reading. And it's really designed to help our students advance their nonfiction reading skills. And it provides them with differentiated online instruction that really is able to meet the students where they are at their Lexile measure. And so what's great about the program is that it's matching our readers with the text at each of their reading ability levels. So next, we're gonna take a look at the data from these programs from the 2020-21 school year. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass this off to my colleagues, um, Executive Director, Ms. Ujima Hosea, and also Mr. Leonardo Lopez. Uh, thank you, Ms. Fortunato. Hello, Dr. Torres, cabinet, community uh, members and our board members. Um, um, as the, uh, Ms. Fortunato stated, I'm going to take a deeper dive in what in our language arts uh, assessments. First is our K through second grade, the Dibbles, uh, which is our comprehension, fluency, phonemic awareness, vocabulary development um, assessment. And if we take a closer look, we have our mid-year and end of the year assessment results for our kindergarten, first and second grade. And what we look at is that um, in our mid-year for kindergarten, um, at our students that were performed at benchmark or above benchmark was 16%. And we're happy to say that they increased, the, our at and above uh, proficient students increased to 32%. Um, in first grade, we had a 36% um, at mid-year for our first graders and they improved to 39%. And in our um, second graders, uh, we had mid-year 41%, and took a slight uh, dip to 39%. But what we do is look at all of the students in all of our areas, um, if they're below, um, um, well below, below, at, or above, and we put in supports for all of our students, um, multi-tiered systems of supports, intervention, programs, um, working with teachers during their first instruction, small group instruction. So we use all of the data to um, uh, plan for our students uh, to increase their skills. Next slide, please. So as I said before, we're celebrating uh, during distance learning our children, we still saw growth and we're excited about that. Our kindergartners went up 16% and our uh, first graders, 3%. And as I said, our second graders were able to maintain, um, but a slight dip, but was able to maintain. So we're happy about that, especially during distance learning. Next slide, please. Um, with the third grade through sixth graders, we use for our reading fluency, I mean, excuse me, reading uh, skills is the iReady. And same thing here, we use the data, uh, we see growth, from the beginning of the year, then we have middle of the year, and then at the end of the year assessments, um, we see the growth. Um, and as I said, again, we are aware of making sure that all of our students, those that are not indicated on these assessments, receive those supports. And so we love to um, make sure that our data tells us the complete story so we can plan for our students. And we're excited about the fact that during that distance learning, we saw growth. Um, next slide, please. And once again, I, I'm, I'm happy to see and say that third grade grew 10%, fourth grade 10%, fifth grade 8%, and um, our sixth graders 9%. So um, we're proud of them for that. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Lopez, please, next slide. Mr. Lopez, you're on mute. My apologies. Good evening, Dr. Uh, Torres, uh, members of the community, uh, the executive cabinet and board members. Um, as we can see in our Achieve 3000 program, we, we see the, the, the benchmark in red above, and then we see the progress from a pre-test, interim test, and post-test as we measure student literacy for each of the grade levels. And as you can see, we are making strides at, uh, at the end of every uh, assessment. Um, this is something that to celebrate, we still, but we still need some work and we are continuing to support the growth uh, of each of our students uh, by providing them all the necessary tools to learn. Next slide, please. 
So this is just more in detail of the previous slide. As you can see, we went up 18% in seventh grade, 8% in eighth grade, 14 for ninth grade, 21 for 10th, 20 for 11th grade, and 22% increase uh, for our literacy for 12th graders. Next slide, please. As we look at our I ready math, again, as, as you can see, in terms of diagnostic one, diagnostic two, which is in blue, and diagnostic three, we see increases for each of the grade levels all the way up. Uh, there is a little bit of a, of a slip at grade nine, uh, but like my former colleague said, we have all the necessary interventions to support the students to continue to, to, continue to provide them with the necessary knowledge and tools to excel and, and increase their scores. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just more of a uh, detail of that previous slide, excluding uh, uh, the, the ninth grade because we that's the one that we took a little bit of a dip. Uh, but as you can see, for grades one, uh, there was a 5% increase, grade two, nine, grade three, 70%, uh, grade four, 15%, grade five, 13, uh, grade six, 13, uh, grade seven, 15%, grade eight, uh, grade eight, eight percent and grade 10, 8% uh, growth. Thank you so much. And, uh, and uh, uh, I wanna uh, let Ms. Fortunato uh, take it from here. Okay, great. So looking forward into this year, and actually you could go ahead and transition to the next slide. That's perfect. Um, we've revised our assessment calendar to really ensure that our assessments are not only aligned to our core instructional program, but they really also allow for our teachers to identify which assessments make the most sense to administer at a given point in time based on the instruction that's going on in the classroom. And so this way, the data is meaningful and also actionable, right? That's really key that it's actionable for both teaching and learning. And so the next slide, please. Additionally, we're going to continue our incredible work that we've done so far around the cycle of inquiry process. So our district leaders, our school leaders, and our teachers will all continue to engage in collaborative conversations throughout the school year as they reflect and investigate the data results from the formative assessments that we talked about earlier, and as they have meaningful conversations around their instructional plans and what the next steps are, as well as, as, well as to really make a commitment to actions that they're going to take to increase student achievement. Next slide, please. And so also as we look ahead, we're looking forward to being able to revisit our data walls at our school site. So these pictures just capture really a small fraction of the fantastic work that had gone on before we had gone on to distance learning about a year and a half or so ago. And so we can't wait to see this continued work this year that our staff at all of our school sites were able to engage in. Next slide. And so I'll hand off to Dr. Lucas. Thank you so much, Mrs. Fortunato. So as we conclude our presentation this evening for our data up, on our data update, um, as Mr. Lopez shared, and obviously Ms. Jose and Ms. Fortunato and I agree, and so do um, all of us, all the adults in the organization, we do have work to do. I don't want to not acknowledge that. I do think it's important that we speak to the fact that during a pandemic, we did experience growth across most of our grade levels in both of the core content area, uh, two of our very important core content areas. That, is a, that was a very difficult thing for our students, teachers, site administrators, the support staff to accomplish. If we all can think back for a second to the challenges and struggles of distance learning, and overcoming all of those while experiencing growth um, with our you know, uh, research-based diagnostic measurements, that is something to pause and take notice of. And if we were able to facilitate that growth during the pandemic, I have every confidence that we'll see even more growth this year. We're not facing all of those um, challenges that we face during distance learning. What are we doing about this? Um, again, I want to remind everyone that our efforts are aligned to our major governing documents. 
We're continuing to fortify our data-driven culture, which Mrs. Fortunato spoke to with our data, our, our data walls. Our cycle of inquiry protected time for teachers and site administrators to analyze the, the data and moreover, apply that analysis to small group instruction, reteaching, adjusting lesson plans. That's the focus. Early literacy instruction certification, we've recognized in our elementary grades, that's no secret. It's very clear from our data that we need intensive support for our um, young students um, to learn how to read and write. So our teachers are participating and we have an initial cohort of teachers participating in a highly acclaimed early literacy instruction certificate program. Same thing at the secondary level. We have secondary teachers starting our first cohort of reading apprenticeship with, with West Ed, which many of us are familiar with, a, a very, very highly respected educational organization. Our tutoring program launches this month um, for our students so that they get the intervention, supports, enrichment, and acceleration they need. We're also launching Saturday School in November, again, to support all of our students. Uh, academic academies in the following areas, because this is what we've assessed based on our data are the most um, the most, uh, most in need. So we've identified reading academies, writing academies, algebra academies, and advanced placement academies for our students. I'm ready, Mr. Arvin. So I'd like to close by again, thanking everyone for listening. We know there's work to do, but the trajectory is on an upward trend. And that's important to note. I'd like to close now and hand it back to Dr. Torres. Thank you so much, Dr. Lucas. And I just wanted to thank you, Ms. Hosea, Ms. Fortunato, Mr. Lopez for your wonderful presentation and update. I too uh, want to congratulate all of our principals, all of our assistant principals, all of our teachers, and especially our students for the great work. And I agree, Dr. Lucas, there is work to do, but during a pandemic, we were able to transition very quickly, almost overnight to distance learning, and we're still able to see growth. And I just wanted to congratulate everyone involved in making that happen. So thank you again for your presentation. We're gonna open it up to our board members to see if they have any questions or comments. Board members. Thank Dr. you. Lucas. Oh, I'm sorry. Brenda. No, go ahead, Dr. VP, go ahead, you got it. Um, Dr. Lucas, you know, I'm excited to hear this report. I love your enthusiasm as always. Uh, to the teachers who are doing this work during a pandemic and our students are showing growth, that makes me excited, that makes me happy. So this report, I'm really happy to hear. I'm very pleased to hear this. We do have work to do, but I'm very pleased with what we're doing. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you. I just had a question for Mr. Lopez uh, regarding the eighth grade uh, decline. Um, I and, and I and I and I and I and I I totally understand. It's 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 with the pandemic and things of that manner. But typically, if if there wasn't a pandemic, isn't there typically a a, a decline usually in that area with the transition? I mean, that's a. Uh, it, that's a very interesting question, um, only because uh, if we're looking at the at the trend and for our previous grade levels, and in this case, if you're looking at the dip in ninth grade, uh, but we've been consistent in, in, in the other grades, uh, I would say that uh, uh, this was really more of a small misstep, but I, I feel like they're, they're wouldn't be a dip. I think that we would be in a position to accomplish and, and meet our target. Mr. Lopez, Mr. Myers, may I thank you so much, Mr. Lopez. I so appreciate that. May I just add a little bit, if you don't mind? Absolutely. Um, to your point, Mr. Myers, and to Mr. Lopez's comments just now, yes, the transition from eighth to ninth, um, because that's where we experienced the dip in ninth, that is, it, it tends to happen between the levels because our students are getting used to the new level, what it means to be a high school student, all the challenges that come with growing up and going to high school. So um, because that point is so astute, I wanna to speak to some of the interventions that Mr. Lopez and the secondary team and site administrators and teachers are leading us through. For example, last summer, 
Um, we had Summer Bridge for the first time, certainly since I've been here, and I think in a long while. Um, and that's a huge step forward. That allowed our ninth grade, our um, our matriculating ninth grade students to understand what high school is about, to see their campus, to understand what supports they were going to receive. They are going to, they were going to receive, excuse me. Additionally, some of the academies, Ms. Fortune, I'm sorry, Arvin, if you could go to the last slide, the next steps, next steps slide, please. Some of these academies we've identified are expressly for ninth grade because of what you just said. Uh, we wanna make sure that they have a lot of support as they transition to high school. So our Algebra Academy, our Literacy Academies are targeted at ninth grade so that they receive those interventions, enrichment and acceleration pieces that they need to be successful in high school. So thank you for that really nuanced question. Thank you. I, I actually knew the answer. I just wanted the community to yeah. be aware that these programs are in place and that these bridge programs are, are really beneficial to our uh, incoming students. So thank you so much for that clarity. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Mr. Myers, thank you so much for your question. We appreciate it. Um, any other questions from board members? Thank you again for this uh, great report. We appreciate it. So we're gonna move to item 7F and as all of you know, on September 15th, 2021, I adopted resolution number 05-2021-2022, declaring October as College and Career Readiness Month. And so Dr. Lucas will present an update on the various partnerships that we have and innovative pathway programs for our students. So welcome back, Dr. Lucas. Thank you so much, Dr. Torres. And again, I am so excited to present this. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't share. This is a deep, deep, deep passion um, of Dr. Torres's, and she's been very committed to it and has made sure that all the resources necessary um, that are necessary are in place to support these efforts. I'm ready, Mr. Arvin. So one way I want to frame the presentation for this evening around CTE, we talk a lot, and rightly so, about equity, access, inclusion, liberation for our students. There's another level to this work and it includes futurity. And for those of you who don't know, I'm not gonna get into a big presentation about that part of it, but futurity means that we can imagine the possibilities for our students even before those possibilities are realized. And we access the understanding of those possibilities for our students so they can imagine their futures that we tear down any barriers or obstacles that would prevent them from imagining the most amazing future for themselves that they deserve to imagine. CTE is part of that notion. The idea that we expose and give our students pathways um, that are based on their interests. So as they get older, as they go through high school, as they move into college and career, they've had these really enriched experiences around the CTE pathways. That's our vision for CTE. It's spelled out here. But in the interest of time, I won't read it to you. Everyone has access to the slide deck. But the notion of this is that we provide an incredible experience for them that aligns to their interest and that prepares them for a very competitive global context. I'm ready, Mr. Arvin. So how are we doing that? We're aligning the CTE programming to all of the major, pro uh, all of the major plans of the district, the governing plans. And you'll hear us say that a lot. Um, we're bringing coherence to the way we approach instruction. We're bringing coherence to the way we roll out these programs and aligning them to the governing documents is incredibly important so that we stay focused in order to make sure that they're successful. So FICMAT of course has standards around this area. The LCAP um, is calls out CTE and funding to ensure that we provide a robust CTE experience. The uh, CTE programming is also outlined in our strategic plan. And lastly, it's certainly mentioned and acknowledged and planned for in the IUSD instructional plan. I'm ready, Mr. Arvin. So again, without reading the slide to you, it's very important that we share with the board and the community, how are we approaching this? What's the instructional alignment for CTE? So this calls out exactly where you can find the CTE action plan in the LCAP and our instructional goals and our key strategies. And we do have performance metrics to hold us as an organization accountable to making sure our CTE programming 
is meeting the needs of our students. So this is what our community, our board members should hold us accountable to, please. That we are rolling out a program that meets all of the promises we're making to our students. I'm ready, Mr. Arvin. College and Career Readiness Development. So what does this mean? It means that the approach to CTE, the CTE implementation is a methodical and measured one. It's important that we build awareness, in the early grades that we provide our students with opportunities to explore and access these pathways while they're pathways while they're young so they understand what their choices might be as they get older we start partnering with um, our educational um, community members such as el camino college and um, scrock southern california regional occupational center we move on to step four where our students actually experience and expand their understanding of these pathways by participating with them and that includes our incredible partnership with south the south bay business and uh, and career centers and lastly sofi stadium is part of these pathways and lastly post-secondary now our students are college and career ready because we've provided them with the pathways to prepare them for the opportunities that await them after they graduate. And then working with the Turner organization to build a better future for them. And when we say better future, they have choices, opportunities, possibilities, and they can imagine careers that we probably can't even imagine today. I'm ready, Mr. Arvin. What are the goals of the CTE pathway? Again, this is connected to the last slide. <clears throat> that we provide curriculum and instruction that aligns to the pathways. In other words, that our pathways are standards-based and rigorous, that our students can exit high school knowing that they are very well prepared for this, uh, the careers that result from the uh, CTE pathways, that we provide them opportunities to explore in preparation for college and career. So if one, for example, if one of these pathways really meets their need, their interest, what they want to do with their lives. They've been well grounded in it. So when they go to college, when they enter a career, they can continue that pathway and actualize their dreams. Post-secondary transition and completion, again, that connection between K-12 and the 12, uh, excuse me, the 1316 system or the college university system. And lastly, that our students have opportunities to work in the environment that is aligned to the CT pathway that they've chosen. So apprenticeships, internships, real life experience in the CTE pathway that they have chosen. I'm ready, Mr. Arvin. And then here's a high level example of what the, the pathway from TK kindergarten through 12th grade looks like. So many people think of CTE as a high school based programming opportunity. It is not. We wanna be very clear that the pathways start with our youngest students. It is our responsibility to expose them to these different opportunities so that as they get older in concert with their parents, they can make well-informed choices. So for example, Ms. Hosea is just as much a part of this planning as is Mr. Lopez and Dr. Kane. This is a continuum we're talking about, not only high school, that's a very important notion for everyone to understand that our little four and five year olds need to start being exposed to these pathways. Just thinking about four and five year olds make us all smile, doesn't it? Okay, I'm ready, Mr. Arvin. And how do we hold ourselves accountable for this and make sure that our students hold themselves accountable? Because part of our responsibility as educators and adults in their lives is that they're empowered to make choices. They're empowered to track their own progress. They're empowered to know what's expected from A through G and CTE so that they fulfill the requirements. While they're still, while they're growing up, our high school students are about to enter their, you know, uh, post high school life as young adults, they still need the supports to get there. This is one such support. Our counselors and our site administrators use these types of documents. This is one example to support our students and their families in tracking their completion of these pathways. That sounds simple, but it's very, very important because these pathways are laid out and we wanna make sure that our students complete all of the courses that will allow them to be certified in these pathways. I'm ready, Mr. Arvin. Okay, here are examples of or the uh, CTE pathways in our high school. So I'll, I'll pause for a moment so you can take a look. And I know I get excited looking at them and I see them all the time. Just the fact that our students have these opportunities to make choices around their interests, their talents, 
what they wanna do when they graduate from high school. And again, please remember that these pathways are tracked back to elementary school and middle school. And Dr. Lucas. Yes, hi, Dr. Kay. I'm on. Um, these pathways were also based on the fact that there were surveys conducted over the past few years with interest from our students. Um, at this point, when we continue moving forward doing surveys, we will add but not take away because if you take away a current pathway, a student who was already enrolled may lose out on that completion of their pathway that they may have started years before. So what we do is we do surveys um, and then we move forward adding additional classes. And some of these pathways actually grew this fall with the support and thanks from El Camino College and SoCal Rock um, and with our high school CTE team. Um, with approvals from our district, thank you very much. We were able to add additional courses and additional CTE teachers to add additional complete pathways. So last year at this time, we did not have this full amount of complete pathways, but we are very proud to say this year that every high school has at least two complete pathways. Um, so that is great progress. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Kane. We're ready, Mr. Arvin. So this slide shows how many enroll, CTE enrollments we have by site. And this is only going to increase given all the information that Dr. Kane just shared. We thought this was an important slide, Dr. Torres. We wanted to make sure that our board members and the community knew these programs are being accessed by our students. We're ready, Mr. Arvin. Dr. Kane, please take it. Okay, next slide. And so how do, how do we make sure, how do we ensure that we are offering pathways and CTE classes of um, successful. And these are the 11 elements. These come down from the state of California that every district that has CTE classes, they have to meet these 11 elements. Um, and so this, this is at the core of all of our decision-making. Next slide. There's two slides here, CTE high quality evaluation. Whenever we are evaluating the success or failure of a pathway in our schools, these are all of the elements that we have to take into consideration. Um, next slide. And these also guide our grants. So when we're applying for grants, or we evaluating how the prior uh, monies were spent, how successful the CTE classes were. Uh, these are the, this is the evaluation tool that we use. Next slide. Okay, so here is, and there's more to this action plan. We just kind of put in some of the main points that we've been working on. Um, I'm a little vision impaired, I had to change that. One of the things that we had to do was do an asset inventory of our current programs district-wide. So in the spring of 2021, um, we looked at the high schools and one of the, our findings was that we had a lot of incomplete pathways and that is because of, it could be a multiple, lack of CTE teachers, um, which I'm so happy to say our union is actually working with our district to um, work on this, this finding in particular, but also our teachers from SoCal Rock and El Camino College were able to fill in the gap with some of this, um, with some of the incomplete pathways. And that's what we were mentioning earlier that we now have complete offerings for our students. Um, we also had to audit our current grants and expenditures and see what grants do we still have uh, and, and what are the, what are the timelines? What are the restrictions? All of the different parts that go to a grant. We did that, but there's a list on this page. And then the next slide, and I'm moving quickly because I don't know how much time you've already taken, Dr. Lucas. I apologize for speaking so quickly. Um, but you can look through, we shared this with everyone and it pretty much shows our what we've done, what the status is, and what the outcome, and moving forward, our timelines. And this is a, a living document. So this will just continue to um, grow. Next slide. Into 2022, 2024, all of those findings on the two prior slides go into this. And it just, we want to, bottom line, we want to increase exposure and opportunities for our babies, starting as small as our CDC. We wanna make sure that every student has opportunities to experience and understand what a career is and touch 
something that leads them to understand what a career is and what college is and just, you know, their interest, peak their interest. Next slide. So in CTE, it is real world experiences. What are we doing? What opportunities? What, what exposure are we providing to our students? It's the education, the quality of the education. Um, it can be in the classroom, it could be in the field. It's our commitment, every single one of us, uh, school sites, the district office, the community, our partnerships. We, we, Dr. Torres' vision was to build stronger partnerships and that has been very, very present um, this year. And then there's student commitment. We have to ensure that our students not only are interested in these pathways, it's something that they wanna do, but that they're committed and we give them as much support as possible. Um, life gets tough and we need to make sure that we're showing up for them to make sure that they follow through and are successful. And all of it is to improve high school graduation rates, college and career readiness, but it's to improve the lives of our children. That's all I have. Thank you so much, Dr. Kane. In conclusion, I wanna thank everyone who's been involved in this effort from Dr. Torres's leadership to Dr. Kane's leadership. I wanna thank Abba Ngissa, president of ITA. She's been incredibly involved in these efforts as has ITA our principals, educational services, cabinet. Thank you to everyone. On um, that concludes our presentation, Dr. Torres. I'd like to hand it back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate this update and I'm so proud of the progress that we have made. So Dr. Kane, congratulations um, to you. I know that as our lead in CTE, you have been very instrumental in ensuring the success of our CTE pathway programs and all of the partnerships that we've developed. So thank you uh, for everything that you have done. Dr. Lucas, congratulations as well. And thank you so much for your commitment, for your leadership. We appreciate you. And also to Ms. Ngisa, um, I've mentioned this so many times that in addition to being a full-time teacher, an amazing uh, president of the Inglewood Teachers Association, she takes her own time. She works on the in the evenings, on the weekends, to develop innovative partnerships on behalf of our students, our staff, and our district. So a special thank you to her as well. And of course, to all of our principals for their leadership and vision. Because when we talked about CT pathway programs, and we said that CT pathways and college and career readiness begins as early as elementary school. Um, they bought on to this idea that, yes, we need to do what's right for our students and commit to this. So thank you to the entire team and congratulations again. Uh, we're going to open it up to our board members to see if they have any questions or comments. Board members. Well, I would like to say the operative word here tonight was possibilities. Uh, that word just jumped out at me because that's what we're offering to our students. And there are so many programs out there and I'm so happy to hear that we're partnering with so many of uh, the organizations in our community and, and connecting with those for our students so that they can see that when they graduate from high school, these are the things that are out there that we can possibly do and they're getting a taste of it. Um, I'm, I'm excited to hear this. I want to thank all of you for doing this because I've always said we needed to have these programs in place for our students and we're moving in the right direction. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Evans. We appreciate your, your comment. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions or comments from board members? Okay. Thank you again. We appreciate the presentation. Uh, so board members and community, we're going to transition to item number eight of our board agenda. We're going to focus on 8A, and this is a public hearing regarding the sufficiency of student textbooks and instructional materials aligned to content standards and use by students in the Inglewood Unified School District for fiscal year 2021-2022. This is per Education Code Section 60119C. There are specific requirements that must be met uh, per Education Code 60119 in order for school districts to be eligible to receive instructional material funds. And so the requirements are that the county administrator hold a public hearing encouraging participation by parents, teachers, community members, and bargaining 
unit leaders, and the hearing shall be held on or before the end of the eighth week after the first day pupils attend school. So the notice of public hearing was posted at all school sites, as well as on the district's website, 10 days in advance of today's public hearing. The public hearing will open at 6.51 p.m. We're now going to hear a public comment. So Ms. Montenegro, do we have any public comments? We do not have any public comments on this hearing uh, this evening, Dr. Torres. Thank you so much. So having concluded uh, our public comment period, uh, this public hearing is now closed at 6.51 p.m. So we're moving on to item number nine. This is public comments on agendized and non-agendized items. The County Administrator and Board of Education welcome input from the public Speakers wishing to address the county administrator and board on agenda and non-agenda topics must complete the public comment submission form available on the district's website at inglewoodusd.com. And we uh, recommended that individuals register to speak prior to the board meeting. So three minutes will be allotted to each speaker and a maximum of 30 minutes for public comment on agenda items and a maximum of 30 minutes for public comment on non-agenda items will be allotted during the public comment period. If the public, public comment cards exceed 10 cards per section, the county administrator may reduce the time allowed from three minutes to either two or one minute per person to hear for more speakers. Requests may also be submitted by mail to the county administrator at 401 South Inglewood Avenue, Inglewood, California, 90301. Any individual who has not previously registered to speak may register now. And registration to speak shall close in three minutes from this time. The guidelines for public comment will be in accordance with board bylaw 9323. Okay. Um, this is
Okay, board members and community, uh, we wait at the additional three minutes. I'm gonna ask Ms. Montenegro if we have any public comments on agenda and non-agenda items. Uh, we did receive two public comments this evening, Dr. Torres. Uh, one is on agenda items and non-agenda items. We actually received other communication, but because there were no names provided, we will not be able to get those comments allowed. Okay. And both comments are uh, were submitted in writing, uh, so not in real time. And the first one is regarding item 12B9 from Ms. Yael first, regarding agenda items. And it says, 12B9, while roofing and waterproofing to provide roof replacements and repairs at La Tijera Academy, that Southern's TK8 school, district office portable restrooms, and district office main building. Please add solar panels to reduce IUSD carbon footprint and lower cost to the district. Over City Schools did this two years ago and have helped the environment while saving money for the school district. We need to listen to the science and do our part. We have many buildings and can collect on weekends, holidays, and during summer when we are not even at schools. Moving on to the non-agenda item from Mr. Philip Morris. Parents, teachers, students, and friends of the district are requesting an end to receivership and the resignation of Erica Torres, Bernadette Lucas, and Rafael Guzman. We believe they are guilty to state ethical violations and would like the Attorney General to issue criminal referral and arrest of three of them. The Unified School District, the only district that is in receivership, and that's a moral problem that needs to end. Thank you. And that concludes our public comments this evening. Okay, thank you, Ms. Montenegro. We will move to item 11. This is reporting out of closed session actions. In closed session, the county administrator took action to reject claim number 04 2021 2022 and 05 2021 2022. We're now going to move to our consent calendar action items. We're going to begin with 12A under the Division of Human Resources. Uh, board members, do you have any questions? or comments regarding items 12A1 through 12A8. None at this time. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. 12A5. 12A5. Thank you. Uh, so do you have a question on 12A5? Um, go ahead, Ms. Evans. Yeah. I wanted to know if this position has been established or if we're just establishing it and if it's available to be applied for and how do people apply for this position if it's, if it's a new position. Thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna ask Ms. Egan from Human Resources um, to assist with response. Ms. Egan? And thank you're you. on mute. Oh, go ahead, thank you. Sorry. Thank you, yes. Um, so this is a position, I'm just double checking right now to make sure that it's still posted. Um, but it is something that is available when we post these positions, it's available to anyone who would like to apply via our website. You can access, access it through our website um, directly or through EdJoin or um, government jobs. And I'm just double checking to see if this one is still posted right now. I don't see this one, though it might have closed or hasn't been posted, but I can double check that. So, Ms. Egan, this um, actual position will be posted tomorrow after we approve it this evening. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, board members, any other questions or comments regarding item 12A through 12A8? Sorry, 12A1 through 12A8. Correction, please. Right. Thank you so much for your question. So items 12A1 through 12A8 are each approved. Uh, we're now moving to item 12B. This is under the Division of Business Services. Uh, board members, do you have any questions or comments regarding items 12B1 through 12B9? No questions at this time, Dr. Uh, Torres. Thank you so much. Items 12B1 through 12B9 are each approved. We're now moving to 12C. This is under Measure GG and Facilities. 
And before we move forward with these items, I just want to reference one of the items here, which is 12 C8 um, on tonight's agenda. So uh, this is the approval of the agreement for consulting services in connection with develop, development of a facilities master plan by and between the Inglewood Unified School District and Little uh, Diversified Architectural Consulting. And so I just want all of you to be aware that the district has undertaken and completed a robust request for qualifications for and proposals uh, to select a facilities master planning firm to assist us in extensive short and long-term facilities planning for its programs and school sites. And so this RFQ P was widely distributed in the industry. It was also advertised in Inglewood today and published on the district's website. And so after a careful review and consideration of the written proposals, two firms were invited to be interviewed. And after the interviews were completed, little diversified architectural consulting was selected and they are the best candidates. So I'm pleased to announce the approval of item 12C8 on tonight's agenda, which is the agreement for facilities master planning with Little. And so Little's compensation is not to exceed the amount of 275,155 and the funding for the facilities master planning services will be provided from the bond programs and other sources as appropriate. And so, board, do you have any questions or comments regarding items 12C1 through 12C8? None at this time. Thank you so much. Items 12C1 through 12C8 are each approved. We're now moving to 12D under the Division of Educational Services. Uh, board members, do you have any questions or comments regarding items 12D1 through 12D11? Hearing none, items 12D1 through 12D11 are each approved. We're now moving to 12E under Student Support Services and Operations. Board members, do you have any questions regarding 12E1? Okay. Being that we don't have any questions or comments, 12E1 is approved. We're now moving to 12F under County Administrator. And before we move forward, I just want to reference um, for our board and community item 12F3, which is on tonight's agenda. And so item 12F3 is a resolution of the county administrator of the Inglewood Unified School District proclaiming a local emergency and authorizing remote teleconference meetings until the period of November 6, 2021. Board members, do you have any questions with regards to this item? I have a question. Yes, Ms. Evans. We are going to remain remote for this month and next month, and that's it. We start back again in December with in-person meetings. Is that what this is stating? Well, we are only able to authorize this resolution and extend the period one month or 30 days at a time. And mm -hmm. so we will continue to monitor the state of this pandemic, and we will have the opportunity to continue to extend it as long as uh, we deem fit. Okay, okay. Okay, so it, it's 30 days at a time. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, board members, do you have any questions or comments regarding items 12F1 through 12F5? Okay, 12 F1 through 12. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ms. Evans. Uh, 12 um, F1. I understand we are going to be uh, attending this conference remotely, which is a good thing that will save the district some money so that we don't have to stay in hotels and so forth. I want to let the public know that we're not spending money frivolously and we will be attending the conference remotely. So, um, Ms. Evans, thank you for that. I, I just wanted to clarify that the virtual uh, conference that you're referring to is the CSBA conference. Um, the, the CASB conference that is on this item, 12F1, is in San Diego. Board members, do you have any other questions or comments regarding 12F1 through 12F5?
So items 12F1 through 12F5 are each approved. So now we're moving to item 13A, this is approval of minutes. Uh, board members, do you have any questions or comments regarding the minutes of the September 15th, 2021 board meeting? Okay. So the minutes of the September 15th, 2021 board meeting are each approved. Uh, board members, uh, we're moving now to item number 14. Uh, board member remarks, we'll begin with Dr. McGee. Thank you, Dr. Torres. I have no remarks um, other than I'm wearing pink in honor of breast cancer awareness. So everybody get your pink out for the rest of the month. Thank you for your support, Dr. McGee. Um, any other comments from our board members? Sure, I'd like to add that um, with uh, Ms. Evans, um, I think to be kind of, uh, well, 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 to be transparent with the community, she is right. Um, we all agreed as, as board members not to attend uh, the CSBA conference, which literally has a letter taken in and taken out of the CAPSI uh, which stands for the California uh, uh, Black. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Press. You got to help me. But 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 CAPSI is a different conference focused on um, uh, the Black uh, educators that are that are uh, in our state. And so it's it, there. There are two different conferences. But but the uh, but the CSB CSBA one we are going to attend virtually to. Uh, save the district uh, funds on that one. Uh, but overall, great job tonight, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Torres, uh, Dr. Lucas. Uh, amazing job to just your cabinet. And thank you, community, for joining in. Thank you for the comments. We we do appreciate that. And we're going to definitely take those into account. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Any other uh, remarks from board members? I did want to clear that up because Dr. Torres, you said CSBA, and I'm looking at 12C1 and it's CAPSE, C A B S E. I thought that's the one that we're going to attend virtually, the one that was in San Diego. So we don't have to go to San Diego. I wasn't talking about CSBA. Yeah, just to clarify, uh, Ms. Evans, the CAPSE conference is in San Diego. The CSBA um, that you're referencing, that is going to be a virtual one. Uh, oh wait, I'm oh CSBA is virtual, not yes. CAPC. Well, yes. see, that's not what I was told. That's that's why I'm trying to clear this up. I have a conflict with that, so I need to clear up if the CSBA, not CSBA, CAPC, C A B S E, is going to be virtual. Okay, so I, I will have uh, Miss Zambrano um, reach out to you, Miss Evans. Thank you thank for you. that. You're thank very you. welcome. Okay, thank you so much for uh, your remarks. We're gonna move to item number 16. Our next uh, board meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, October 27th, 2021. And moving on to item number 17. Um, tonight, we will adjourn this meeting in memory of Ms. Sandra Davis, Ms. Davis was born on May 14, 1952. She was the wife uh, to Bilson Davis and the mother of eight children. And the importance of family and community was the driving force that led her in her role as a community advocate. She was an active public and community servant in Los Angeles for over 20 years. And her impact has been a continual mantra in the community as evidenced in her role as the CEO, Executive Director of Community Centers, Inc., or CCI, a 40-year-old nonprofit 501c3 in South Los Angeles. And Mrs. Uh, Ms. Davis's uh, accomplishments include breaking the glass ceiling to become the first African-American elected in Culver City, who's president of the Culver City Board of Education as the first becoming a teacher for LAUSD after raising her children. 
She chaired the California 47th Assembly District Education Commission. She served on the Culver City Strategic Planning Commissions for the city and school district. And she was a founding member of Education as a Civil Right, an organization that addresses the issues of failing minority students. She also served as director for the White Rose Foundation. She was also a founding member and vice president of Education is a Civil Right. She was a lifetime member of New Frontier Democratic Club. She was vice president of the Inglewood Pacific Chapter of the Links Incorporated. She was a member of the Coalition of 100 Black Women, Women on Target, and vice president of the Lullaby Guild. So as a result of community and education advocacy, Ms. Davis received the Democrat of the Year Award from the Democratic Party, Emerging Leader Award from the NAACP for her work in breaking down barriers, including helping to initiate the Martin Luther King celebration in Culver City, Delta, Delta Sigma Theta Woman of Honor Award, City of Los Angeles 8th District Woman of the Year Award, Commission on the Status of Women Advocacy Award on behalf of women and children and the 54th Legislative District Distinguished Delegate Award. Ms. Sandra Davis passed away September 23rd, 2021. Our condolences to our entire community, to her family, to all of her friends and colleagues. Our meeting will stand adjourned at 7, 12 p.m. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.